The Iliad, Book 15. But after they had crossed back over the ditch and the sharp stakes in flight, and many had gone down under the hands of the Danans, they checked about once more and stood their ground by the chariots, green for fear and terrified. But now Zeus awakened, wakened by Hera of the gold throne on the high place, places of Ida, and stood suddenly upright, and saw the Achaeans and Trojans, these driven to flight, the others hearing them in confusion, these last Argives, and saw among them the Lord Poseidon. He saw Hector lying in the plain, his companions sitting around him. He dazed at the heart and breathing painfully, vomiting blood, since not the weakest Achaean had hit him. Then the father of gods and men, seeing Hector, pitied him and looked scowlingly terribly at Hera and spoke a word to her. Hopeless one, it was your evil design, your treachery, Hera, that stayed brilliant Hector from battle, terrified his people. I do not know, perhaps for this contrivance of evil and pain, you will win first reward when I lash you with whip strokes. But you do not remember that time you hung from high, and on your feet I slung two anvils, and about your hands drove a golden chain unbreakable. You among the clouds and bright sky hung, nor could, could the gods about tall Olympus endure it and stood about, but could not set you free. If I caught one, I would seize and throw him from the threshold until he landed stunned on the earth. Yet even so, the weariless agony for Heracles, the godlike, would not let go of my spirit. You, with the north wind's aid, winning over the storm winds, drove him on across the desolate sea in evil intention, and then on these swept him away to coast the strong founded. I myself rescued him there and brought him back once more to horse-pasturing Argos, when he had been through with much hardship. I remind you of all this, so you will give up your deceptions. See if your love-making in bed will help you. That way you lay with me apart from the gods and deceived me. He spoke, and the lady, the oxide goddess Hera, was frightened, and she spoke to him and dressed him in winged words. Now let earth be my witness in this, and the wide heaven above us, and the dripping water of the Styx, which oath is the biggest and most formidable oath among the blessed mortals. The sanctity of your head be witness in the bed of marriage between us, a thing by which I at least could never swear vainly. It is not through my will that the shaker of the earth Poseidon afflicts the Trojans and Hector and gives aid to the others, but it is his own passion that urges him to do to it and drives him. He saw the Achaeans hard-pressed beside their ships and pitied them. No, but I myself also would give him counsel to go with you, O dark-clouded, that, that way that you lead us. She spoke, and now the father of gods and men smiled on her and spoke again and answered her and addressed her in winged words. If even you, Lady Hera of the Oxeyes, hereafter were to take your place among the immortals thinking as I do, then, then Poseidon, hard though he may wish it otherwise, must at once turn his mind so it follows your heart and my heart. If now all this that you say is real and you speak truthfully, go now among the generations of gods and summon Iris to come and hear to me, and Apollo the glorious archer, so that Iris may go among the bronze-armed people of the Achaeans and give a message to Lord Poseidon to lead the fighting and come back to the home that is his. Also let Phoebus Apollo stir Hector back into battle, breathe strength into him once more, and make him forget the agonies that are now wearing out his senses. Let him drive strengthless panic into the Achaeans and turn them back once more. Let them be driven in flight and tumble back on the bent ships of Achilles, Peleus' son. And he shall rouse up Patroclus, his companion, and glorious Hector shall cut down Patroclus with the spear before Ilion, after he has killed many others, the young men, and among them my own son, shining Sarpedon. In anger for him, brilliant Achilles shall then kill Hector. And from then on I would make the fighting surge back from the vessels always and continuously, until the Achaeans capture headlong Ilion through the designs of Athene. For this I am not stopping my anger, and I will not let any of the immortals stand there by the Danans until the thing I asked by the son of Peleus has been accomplished, as I undertook at the first and bent my head and assent to it, on that day when embracing my knees immortal Thetis supplicated honor for Achilles, sacker of cities. He spoke, and the goddess of the white arms hair did not disobey him, but went back to tall Olympus from the mountains of Ida. As the thought flashes the mind of a man who, traversing much territory, thinks of things in the mind's awareness, I wish I were this place, or this, and imagines many things. So rapidly in her eagerness winged Hera a goddess. She came to sheer Olympus and entered among the assembled immortal gods in the house of Zeus, and they seeing her arose all to swarm about her and lifted their cups in greeting. But Hera passed by the others and accepted a cup from Themis of the fair cheeks, since she had first come running to greet her and had spoken to her and addressed her in winged words. Hera, why have you come? You seem like one who has been terrified. I know. It was the son of Kronos. Your husband frightened you. In turn, the goddess Hera of the White Arms answered her, Ask me nothing of this, divine Themis. You yourself know what his spirit is, how it is stubborn and arrogant. Preside still over the gods in their house. 
the feast's fair division. Yet so much may you hear, and with you all the immortals, how Zeus discloses evil actions, and I do not think the heart of all will be pleasure to like, neither among mortals nor gods either, all although one now still feasts at his pleasure. The Lady Hera spoke so, and sat down, and the gods about the house of Zeus were troubled. Hera was smiling with her lips, but above the dark brows her forehead was not at peace. She spoke before them all in vexation. Fools, we who try to work against Zeus thoughtlessly, still we are thinking in our anger to go near and stop him by argument or force. He sits apart and cares nothing nor thinks of us, and says that among the other immortals he is preeminently the greatest in power and strength. Therefore, each of you must take whatever evil he sends you, since I think already a sorrow has been wrought against Ares. His son has been killed in the fighting, dearest of all men, to him, Ascalaphos, whom stark Ares calls his own son. So she spoke. Then Ares struck against both his big thighs with the flats of his hands and spoke a word of anger and sorrow. Now you who have your homes on Olympus, you must not blame me for going among the ships of the Chians and avenging my son's slaughter, even though it be my fate to be struck by Zeus's thunderbolts and sprawl on the blood and dust by the dead men. So he spoke, and ordered fear and terror to harness his horses, and himself got into his shining armor. And there might have been wrought another anger and bitterness from Zeus still greater, more wearisome among the mortals, had not Athene, in her fear for the sake of all gods, sprung up and out through the forecourt, left her chair where she was sitting, and taken the helmet off from his head, the shield from his shoulders, and snatched out his heavy hand the bronze spear, and fixed it apart, and then in speech reasoned with violent Ares. Madman, maze of your wits, this is ruin. Your ears can listen still to reality, but your mind is gone, and your discipline. Do not hear what the goddess Hera, the white arms, tells us, and she coming back even now from Zeus of Olympus. Do you wish, after running the course of many misfortunes yourself, still to come back to Olympus under compulsion, though reluctant, and plant seed of great sorrow among the rest of us? Since he will at once lead the Achaeans and the high-hearted Trojans and come back to batter us on Olympus, and will catch up as they come the guilty one and the guiltless. Therefore I ask you, ask of you to give up your anger for your son. By now some other better of his strength and hands than your son was has been killed, or will soon be killed, and it is a hard thing to rescue all the generation and seed of all mortals. So she spoke, and seated on a chair of violent Ares, but Hera called to come but Hera called to come with her outside the house Apollo and Iris, who is messenger among the immortal gods, and spoke to them and addressed them in winged words. Zeus wishes both of you to go to him with all speed at Ida, but when you have come there and looked upon Zeus's countenance, then you must do whatever he urges you and his orders. So the Lady Hera spoke, and once more returning sat on her throne. They, in a flash of speed, winged their way onward. They came to Ida with all their springs, the mother of wild beasts, and found the wide-browed son of Kronos on the height of Gargagon. Gar Gargaron, sitting still, and fragrant cloud gathered in a circle about him. These two came in the presence of Zeus, the cloud gatherer, and stood. Nor was his heart angry when he looked upon them, seeing they had promptly obeyed the message of his dear lady. He spoke to Iris first of the two, and addressed her in winged words. Go on your way now, swift Iris, to the Lord Poseidon, and give him all this message, nor be a false messenger. Tell him that he must now quit the war and the fighting, and go back among the generations of gods, or into the bright sea. And if he will not obey my words or thinks nothing of them, then let him consider in his heart and his spirit that he might not, strong though he is, be able to stand up to my attack, since I say I am far greater than he is in strength, and elder born, yet his inward heart shrinks not from calling himself the equal of me, though others shudder before me. He spoke, and swift footed Iris did not disobey him, but went down along the hills of Ida to sacred Ilion. As those times when out of the clouds of snow or hail whirls cold beneath the blast of the wind, north wind, borne in the bright air, so rapidly in her eagerness winged Iris the swift one, and stood beside the famed shaker of the earth and spoke to him. I have a certain message for you, dark-haired earth encircler, and came here to bring it to you from Zeus of the Aegis. His order is that you quit the war and fighting and go back among the generations of gods or into the bright sea, and if you will not obey his words or think nothing of them, his threat is that he himself will come to fight with you here, strength against strength, but warns you to keep from under his hands, since he says he is far greater than you are in strength and elder born. Yet your inward heart shrinks from not calling yourself the equal of him, though others shudder before him. Then deeply vexed, the famed shaker of the earth spoke to her, No, no, great though he is, this that he has said is too much, if he will force me against my will, me who am his equal in rank. Since we are three brothers, born by Rhea to Kronos, Zeus and I, and the third is Hades, Lord of the dead men. 
All was divided among us three ways, each given his domain. I, when the lots were shaken, drew the gray sea to live in forever. Hades drew the lot of the mists and the darkness, and Zeus was a lot of the wide sky and the clouds and the bright air. But earth and high Olympus are common to all three. Therefore I am no part of the mind of Zeus. Let him in tranquility and powerful as he stay, he is stay satisfied with his third share, and let him absolutely stop frightening me, as if I were mean with his hands. It were better to keep for the sons and daughters he got himself these blusterings and these threats of terror. They will listen, because they must, to whatever he tells them. Then in swift turn, swift, then in turn, swift footed, Iris answered him. Am I then to carry, O dark-haired earth encircler, this word which is strong and steep back to Zeus from you? Or will you change a little? The hearts of the great can be changed. You know the Furies, how they forever side with the elder. Then in the turn the shaker of the earth Poseidon spoke to her. Now this, divine Iris, was a word quite properly spoken. It is a fine thing when a messenger is conscious of justice, but this thing comes as a bitter sorrow to my heart and my spirit. When Zeus tries in words of anger to reprimand one who is his equal on station, and endowed with destiny like his, still this time I will give way for all my vexation, but I will say this also and make it a threat in my anger. If ever acting apart from me and Athene the spoiler, apart from Hera and Her Hermes and the lord of Hephaestus, he shall, spare, he shall spare headlong Ilion and shall not be willing to take it by storm and bestow great victory on the Argives, let him be sure there will be no more healing of our anger. The shaker of the earth spoke and left the Achaean people and went merging in the sea, and the fighting Achaeans longed for him. After this, Zeus, who gathers the clouds, spoke to Apollo. Go now, beloved Phoebus, to the side of brazen-helmed Hector, since by this he who encircles the earth and shakes it has gone into the bright sea and has avoided the anger that would be ours. In truth, this would have been a fight those other gods would have heard about, to gather to Kronos beneath us, who gathered to Kronos beneath us. Now this way was far better for me and for himself also, that for all his vexation before he gave way to my hands. We would have sweated before this business was finished. Now yourself take up your hands in the Aegis with fluttering tassels, and shake it hard to scare the Achaean fighters. Then, strike her from afar, let your own concern be glorious Hector. So long waken the huge strength in him, until the Achaeans run in flight, and come to the ships in the crossing of Heli. From there on, my, on I myself shall think of the word and the action to make the Achaeans get wind once more after their hard fighting. He spoke, and he spoke so, and Apollo, not disregarding his father, came down along the mountains of Ida in the likeness of a rapid hawk, the dove's murderer, and swiftest of all flying things. He found brilliant Hector, the son of wise Priam, sitting now no longer sprawled as he gathered new strength back into him and recognized his companions about him. The sweat and hard breathing had begun to stop, once the will in Zeus the Aegis wakened him. Apollo, who works from afar, stood beside him and spoke to him. Hector, son of Priam, why do you sit in such weakness, here apart from the others? Did some disaster befall you? In his weakness, Hector the Shining Helm spoke to him. Who are you who speak to me face to face, O noblest of gods? Did you not know how the Achaeans grounded ships? Ias, the great war cry, struck me in the chest with a boulder as I slaughtered his companions and stayed my furious valor. Truly, I thought that on this day I would come to the corpses of the house of the death god once I breathed the inward life from me. In turn, the Lord, the worker from afar, Apollo, spoke to him. Take heart. Such an avenger am I whom the son of Cronos sent down from Ida to stand by your side and defend you, Phoebus Apollo, the golden sword, who in time before this also stood to defend yourself and your sheer citadel. So come now and urge on your cavalry in their numbers to drive on their horses against the hollow ships. Meanwhile, I shall move on before you and make all the way for the horses smooth before them and bend back the Achaean fighters. He spoke and breathed huge strength into the shepherd of the people. As when some stalled horse who has been corn-fed at the manger, breaking free of his rope, gallops over the plain in thunder to his accustomed bathing place in the sweet running river, and in the pride of his strength holds high his head and the mane floats over his shoulders. Sure of his glorious strength, the quick knees carry him to the love places and the pasture of horses. So Hector, moving rapidly his feet and his knees, went onward, stirring the horsemen when he heard the god's voice speak. And as men who live in the wilds and their dogs are driven into a flight, a horned stag or a wild goat, inaccessible, the rocky cliff over the shadowed forest has covered the quarry, so the men know it was not their fortune to take him. And now by their clamoring shows in the way the gr a great bearded lion and bends them in sudden flight for all their eagerness. So the Danans, until that time, kept always in close chase assembled, stabbing at them with swords and leaf-headed spears. But when they saw Hector once more ranging the men's ranks, they were frightened. 
and by their feet collapsed all their bravery. Now Thoas spoke forth among them, the son of a Andriamon, far best of the Aetolians, one skilled in the spear's throw and brave in close fight. In assembly, few of the Achaeans, when the young men contended in debate, could outdo him. He, in kind intention, now spoke forth and addressed them. Can this be? Here is a strange thing I see with my own eyes. How this Hector he has got to his feet once more and eluded the death spirits. I think in each of us the heart had high, high hope he was killed under the hands of Telamonian Ias. Now some one of the gods who has come to his help and rescued Hector, who has, unst has unstrung the knees of so many Danans, I think he will do it once more now. It is not without Zeus, the deep thundering, that he stands there, champion in all this fury. Come then, let us do as I say, let us all be persuaded. Let us tell the multitude to make its way back toward the vessels, while we ourselves, who claim we are greatest in all the army, stand and see if we can face him first, and hold him off from them with spears lifted against him. And I think for all his fury, his heart will be afraid to plunge into our Danian company. So he spoke, and they listened to him with care, and obeyed him. They who rallied about Ias, the lord Idomeneus, Teucros, Mirones, and Meges, the man like the war god, closed their order for hard impact, calling on the bravest to face Hector and the Trojans. Meanwhile, behind them, the multitude made their way back toward the ships of the Achaeans. The Trojans came down on them in a pack, and Hector led them in long strides, and in front of him went Phoebus Apollo, wearing a mist about his shoulders and held the temptuous, terrible Aegis, shaggy conspicuous that the bronze smith Hephaestus had given Zeus to wear to the terror of mortals. Gripping this in both hands, he led on the Trojan people. But the Argives stood in close order against them, and the battle cry rose up in a thin scream from either side, and the arrows from the bowstrings jumping, while from violent hands the numerous thrown spears were driven, some deep in the bodies of quick-stirring young men, while many in the space between before they had got to the white skins stood fast in the ground, though they had been strained to reach the bodies. So long as Phoebus Apollo held still in his hands the Aegis, so long the thrown weapons of both took hold, and men dropped under them. But when he stared straight in the eyes of the fast mountain Danans, and shook the Aegis, and himself gave a great bearing, bearing cry, the spirit inside them was amazed to hear it. They forgot their furious valor. And they, as when in the dim of the black night, two wild beasts stampede a herd of cattle or a big flock of sheep falling suddenly upon them, when no herdsman is by, the Achaeans fled so in their weakness and terror, since Apollo drove terror upon them, and gave the glory to the Trojans and Hector. There, man killed man all along the scattered encounter. Hector first killed Stythios and Archesileos, one of the leader of the bronze armed Botoians, the other trusted companion arms of great hearted Menestheus. But Aeneas slaughtered Medon and Iosus. Of these, Medon was a bastard son of godlike Oileus, and therefore brother of Ias, but had made his home in Philaki, away from the land of his fathers, having killed a man, a relation of Reopis, his stepmother, the wife of Oileus. Iosus was a leader appointed of the Athenians, and was called the son of Sphephalos, the son of Bocolos. Polydamos killed Mycestius and Polides Echios in the first onfall, and brilliant Agenor cut down Cloinios. Paris struck in Dicos from behind at the shoulders base as he ran away to the front ranks and drove the bronze clean through. While these stripped the armor from their men, meanwhile the Achaeans, blundering about the deep dug drit ditch and the sharp stakes, ran this way and that in terror, forced into their rampart. But Hector called aloud in piercing cry to the Trojans, Make hard for the ships, let the bloody spoils be. That man I see in the other direction apart from the vessels, I will take care that he gets his death. And that man's relations, neither men nor women, shall give his dead body the right of burning. In the space before our city, the dogs shall tear him to pieces. So speaking, with a whip stroke from the shoulder, he lashed on his horses, calling across the ranks of the Trojans, who along with him all cried aloud as they steered the horses to pull their chariots with inhuman clamor. And in front of them, Phoebus Apollo, Easily, kicking them with his feet, tumbled the banked edges on the deep ditch into the pit between, the bridged over a and bridged over a pathway both wide and long, about as long as the force of a spear cast goes when a man has thrown it to try his strength. They streamed over in massed formation, with Apollo in front of them holding a tremendous Aegis, and wrecked the bastions of the Achaeans easily, as when a little boy piles sand by the seashore, when his innocent play he makes sand towers to amuse him, and then, still playing, his hands and feet ruins them and wrecks them. So you, Lord Apollo, piled in confusion much hard work and painful done by the Argives, and drove terror among them. 
So they reined in and stood fast again beside their ships, calling aloud upon each other. And to all the gods, uplifting their hands, each man to them cried out his prayers in a great voice. And beyond others, Jerani and Nestor, the Achaeans' watcher, prayed, reaching out both arms to the starry heavens. Father Zeus, if ever in wheat dip Argos one of us burning before you the rich thigh pieces of sheep or ox prayed, he would have come home again. And you nodded your head and assented. Remember this, Olympian, save us from the day without pity. Let not the Achaeans be beaten down like this by the Trojans. So he spoke in prayer, and Zeus of the councils thundered a great stroke, hearing the prayer of the old man, the son of Nellius. But the Trojans, hearing the thunderstroke of Zeus of the Aegis, remembered even more their warcraft, and sprang on the Argives. They, as when the big waves of the sea wide wandering wash across the walls of a ship underneath the leaning forces of the wind, which particularly piles the big waves, so the Trojans with huge clamor went over the rampart, and drove their horses to fight alongside the grounded vessels with leaf-headed spears, some at close quarters, others from their horses. But the Achaeans, climbing high on their black ships, fought from them with long pikes that lay among the holes for sea fighting, shrouded about the heads and bronze that was soldered upon them. Meanwhile, Patroclus, all the time the Achaeans and Trojans were fighting on both sides of the wall, far away from the fast ships, had sat all this time in the shelter of the courtly Eurypylos, and had been entertaining him with words and applying medicines that would mitigate the black pains to the sore wound. But when he saw the Trojans were sweeping over the rampart, and the outcry of the noise of terror from the Danans, Patroclus groaned aloud then, and struck himself on both thighs of the flats of his hands, and spoke a word of lamentation. Eurypylos, much though you need me, I cannot stay here longer with you. This is a big fight that has arisen. Now it is for your henchmen to look after you, while I go in haste to Achilles, to stir him into fighting. Who knows if, with God helping, I might trouble a spirit to be... to spirit by entreaty since the persuasion of a friend is a strong thing as he was speaking his feet carried him away meanwhile the king stood steadily against the trojan attack but they could not beat the enemy fewer as they were away from their vessels nor again had the trojan strength to break the battalions of the danans and force their way into the ships and the shelters but as a chalk like chalk line straightens the cutting of a ship's timber in the hands of an expert carpenter who by Athene's inspiration is well versed in all his craft subtly. So the battles fought by both sides were pulled fast and even. Now by the ships others fought in their various places, but Hector made straight for glorious Ias. These two were fighting hard for a single ship, and neither was able. Hector to drive Ias off the ship and to set fire to it, nor Ias to beat Hector back, since the divinity drove him. Shining Ias struck with a spear, Kel- Calator, Calaidios' son, in the chest as he brought fire to the vessel. He fell thunderously, and the torch dropped from his hand. Then Hector, with his eyes, when his eyes were aware of his cousin fallen in the dust in front of the black ship, uplifting his voice in a great cry, called to the Trojans and Lycaeans. Trojans, Lycaeans, Dardanians who fight at close quarters, do not anywhere in this narrow place give way from the fighting, but stand by the son of Calaidios. Do not let the Achaeans strip the armor from him, fallen where the ships are, are assembled. So he spoke, and made a cast at Ias with a shining spear, but missed him, and struck the son of Master, Lycophron, henchman of Ias from Kithera, who had been living with him, for he had killed a man in sacred Kithera. Hector struck him in the head above the ear with a sharp bronze as he stood next to Ias, so that Lycophron, sprawling, dropped from the ship's stern to the ground, and his strength was broken. And Ias shuddered at the sight, and spoke to his brother, Seed to Tikros, our true companion, the son of Master, is killed, who came to us from Cathera, and in our household we was one we honored as we honored our beloved parents. Now great-hearted Hector has killed him. Where are your arrows of sudden death and the bow that Phoebus Apollo gave you? He spoke, and Teucros heard and came running to stand beside him, holding his hand the back-strung bow and the quiver to hold arrows, and let go his hard shots against the Trojans. First he struck down Cletos, the glorious son of Pesinor, and companion of Polydamas, proud son of Panthos. Now Cletos held the reins and gave all his care to the horses, driving them into that place where the most battalions were shaken. For the favor of Hector and the Trojans, but the sudden evil came to him, and none for all their desire could defend him. For the painful arrow was driven into his neck from behind him. He fell out of the chariot, and the fast-footed horses shied away, rattling the empty car. But Polydamas, their master, saw it, one, saw, it, saw it at once, and ran first to the heads of the horses. He gave them into the hands of Astinos, Protean's son, with many orders to be watchful and hold the horses close, then himself went back into the ranks of the champions. 
But Teucros picked up another arrow for bronze-helmed Hector and would have stopped his fighting by the ships of the Achaeans had he hit him during his bravery and torn the life from him. But he was not hidden from the close purpose of Zeus, who was guarding Hector, and denied that glory to Telamonian Teucros, who broke in the unfaulted bow, the close twisted sinew, as Teucros drew it against him, so the bronze-weighted arrow went as the bow dropped out of his hands, driven crazily sidewise. And Teucros shuddered at the sight and spoke to his brother, See now how hard the divinity cuts across the intention in all our battle. Who struck the bow out of my hand, who has broken the fresh twisted sinew of the bowstring I bound on this morning, so it would stand the succession of springing arrows? Then in turn, huge Telamonian Aias answered him, Dear brother, then let your bow and your showering arrows lie, now that the god begrudging the Danans wrecked them. But take a long spear in your hands, a shield on your shoulder, and close with the Trojans, and drive on the rest of your people. Let them not, though they have beaten us, easily capture our strong bent ships. We must remember the frenzy of fighting. He spoke, and Chukros put away the bow in his shelter and threw across his shoulders the shield of the fourfold ox hide. Over his mighty head he set the well-fashioned helmet with the horsehair crest and the plumes nodded, nodded terribly above it. Then he caught up a powerful spear and edged with a sharp bronze and went on his way, running fast, and stood beside Ias. But Hector, when he saw how the arrows of Teuclus were baffled, lifted his voice in a great cry to the Trojans and Lycaeans. Trojans, Lycaeans, Dardanians, who fight at close quarters, be men now, dear friends. Remember your furious valor along the hollow ships, since I have seen with my own eyes how by the hand of Zeus their bravest men's arrows were baffled. Easily seen is the strength that is given from Zeus to mortals, either in those into whose hands he gives a surpassing glory, or those he diminishes and will not defend them. As now he diminishes the strength of the Argives and helps us. Fight on them by the ships together. He who among you finds by spear thrown or spear thrusts his death and destiny, let him die. He has no dishonor when he dies defending his country, for then his wife shall be saved and his children here afterward, and his house and property shall not be damaged, if the Achaeans must go away with their ships to the beloved land of their fathers. So he spoke, and stirred the spirit and strength of each man. But I asked on the other side, called to his companions, Shame, you Argives, here is a time of decision, whether we die or live on still and beat back the ruin from our vessels. Do you expect if our ships fall to helm shining Hector, you will walk each of you back dry shod to the land of your fathers? Do you not hear how Hector is stirring up all his people, how he is raging to set fire to our ships? He is not inviting you to come to a dance. He invites you to battle. For us, there can be no design, no purpose better than this one, to close in and fight with the strength of our hands at close quarters. Better to take in a single time our chances of dying or living than go on being squeezed in the stark encounter right up against our ships as now by men worse than we are. So he spoke and stirred the spirit and strength in each man. There Hector killed the sons of Perimedes, Skedios, lord of the men of Phoicus, but Aias killed Laodamas, leader of the foot soldiers, and the shining son of Antenor. Then Polydamas stripped Oros of killing companion of Magus, Phileas' son, and a lord among the great-hearted Epians. Magus seeing it lunged at him, but Polydamas bent down in a way so that Magus missed him. Apollo would not let Panthos' son go down among the front fighters, but Magus stabbed with a spear in the middle of the chest of Croismos. He fell thunderously, and Magus was stripping the armor from his shoulders. But meanwhile, Dolopos lunged at him. Lampos' son, a man crafted with the spear and strongest of the sons, born to Lampos. Leomedon's son, one skilled in furious fighting. He from close up stabbed with a spear at the shield of Philides in the middle, but the corset that he wore defended him, solid and built with curving plates of metal which in days past Phileas had taken home from Ephria and the river of Silis. A guest and friend had given him it, lord of men Euphides, to carry into the fighting and beat off the attack of the enemy, and now it guarded the body of his son from destruction. But Magi stabbed with a sharp spear at the uttermost summit of the brazen helmet thick with horsehair, and tore off the mane of horsehair from the helmet so that it toppled to groundward and lay in the dust in all its shining, new shining of purple. Yet Dolops stood his ground and fought on in hope of still winning. But meanwhile, warlike Menelaos came to stand beside Magis and came from the side and unobserved with his spear and from behind threw at his shoulder. So the spear tore through his chest in his fury to drive on so that Dolops reeled and went down face forward. The two of them swept in to strip away from his shoulders the bronze armor. But Hector called aloud to his brothers the whole lot, but first scolded the son of Hycateon, strong Melanippos. He and Percote had tended his lumbering cattle in the days before when the enemy was still far off. But when the Orsup ships the Danians came, then he returned to Ilion and was a great man among the Trojans and lived in Priam, who honored him as he honored his children. 
Now Hector spoke a word and called him by name and scolded him. Shall we give way so, Melanippos? Does it mean nothing even to you in the inward heart that your cousin has fallen? Do you not see how they are busied over the armor of Dolopos? Dolop? Dolops? Come on, then. No longer can we stand far off and fight with the Argives. Sooner we must kill them, or else sheer Ilion be stormed utterly by them, and her citizens be killed. He spoke and led the way, and the other followed, a mortal godlike. But huge Telamonian Aya stirred on the Argives. Dear friends, be men. Let shame be in your hearts and discipline, and have consideration for each other in the strong encounters, since more come through alive when men consider each other, and there is no glory when they give way, nor warcraft either. He spoke, and they likewise grew furious in their defense, and put his word away in their hearts and fence in their vessels in a circle of bronze. But Zeus against them wakened the Trojans. Then Menelaus the great war cry stirred on Antilochus. Antilochus, no other Achaean is younger than you are, nor faster on his feet, nor strong as you are in fighting. You can make an outrush and strike down some man of the Trojans. So speaking, he hastened back, but stirred Antilochus onward. And he sprang forth from the champions and hefted the shining javelin, glaring round about him. The Trojans gave way in the face of the man, throwing with a spear. And he made no vain cast, but struck Hecateon's son, Melanippus, the high-hearted, in the chest next to the nipple as he swept into the fighting. He fell thunderously, and darkness closed over both eyes. Antilochus sprang forth against him, as a hound rushes against a stricken fawn, that as he broke from his covert, a hunter is shot at, and hit, and broken his limb's strength. So Antilochus, stubborn in his battle, in battle sprang. Melanippus at you to strip your armor, but did not escape brilliant Hector's notice, who came on in the run to the fighting against him. Antilochus did not hold his ground, although a swift fighter, but fled away like a wild beast who has done some bad thing. One who has killed a hound or an ox herd, tending his cattle, and escapes before a gang of men is assembled against him. So Nestor's son ran away, and after him the Trojans and Hector would unearthly clamor, shower their groaning weapons against him. He turned and stood when he got into the swarm of his own companions. But the Trojans in the likeness of raven, ravening lions swept on against the ships and were bringing to accomplishment Zeus's orders, who awakened always the huge strength in them, dazed the courage of the Argives, and denied their glory and stirred on the others. Zeus's desire was to give glory to the son of Priam, Hector, that he might throw on the curved ships the inhuman weirless strength of fire, and so make completely accomplish the prayer of Thetis. Therefore Zeus of the councils waited the sight before his eyes of the flare when a single ship burned. From there on he would make the attack of the Trojans surge back again from the ships and give the Danaans glory. With this in mind he drove on against the hollow ships Hector, Priam's son, though Hector without the god was in fury and rage, and when, as when destructive fire or spear-shaking Ares rages among the mountains and dense places of the forest deep, deep forest. A slaver came out around his mouth, and under the lowering brows his eyes were glittering. The helm of his temples was shaken and thundered horribly to the fightening of Hector. Out of the bright sky, Zeus himself was working to help him, and among him so numerous he honored this one man and glorified him, since Hector was to have only a short life, and already the day of his death was being driven upon him by Pallas Athene through the strength of Achilles. And now he was probing the ranks of men and trying to smash them, and made for where there were most men together and the best armor, but even so he could not break them for all his fury, for they closed into a wall and held him, like some towering huge sea cliff that lies close along the gray salt water, and stands up against the screaming winds in their sudden directions, and against the waves that grow to bigness and burst it up against it. So the Danaans stood steady against the Trojans, nor gave way. But he lit about with flames on all sides, charged on their numbers, and descended upon them as descends on a fast ship the battering waves storm red from beneath the clouds, and the ship goes utterly hidden from the foam, and the dangerous blast of the hurricane thunders against the sail, and the hearts of the seamen are shaken with fear, as they are carried only a little way out of the death's reach. So the heart of the breast of re- so the heart in the breast of each Achaean was troubled. Hector came on against them as a murderous lion on cattle, who was low-lying meadow of a great marsh pastured by hundreds, and among them a herdsman who does not quite know how to fight a wild beast off from killing a horn-curved ox, and keeps pace with the first and the last of the cattle, always. But the lion making a spring at the middle eats an ox as the rest stampede. So now the Achaeans fled in unearthly, unearthly terror before Father Zeus and Hector, all, but he got one only, Periphetes of Mycenae, beloved son of Coprius, who for the lord Eurystheus had gone often with messages to power for Heracles. To him a meaner father was born a son who was better for all talents in the speed of his feet and in battle, and for intelligence counted among the first in Mycenae. 
thereby now higher was the glory granted to Hector. For as he whirled about to get back, he fell out he fell over the outrim of the shield he carried, which reached to his feet to keep the spears from him. Stumbling on this, he went over on his back, and the helmet that circled his temples clashed horribly as he went down. Hector saw it sharply and ran up and stood beside him, and struck the spear into his chest and killed him before the eyes of his dear friends, who for all their sorrowing could do nothing to help their companion, being themselves afraid of great Hector. Now they had gone among the ships, and the inns were about them, and the ships hauled up in the first line, but the Trojans swarmed on them. The Argives, under force, gave back from the first line of their ships, but along the actual shelters they rallied in the group and did not scatter along the encampment. Shame held them in fear. They kept up a continuous, up a continuous call to each other. And beyond others, Journey and Nestor, the Achaeans' watcher, supplicated each man by the knees for the sake of his parents. Dear friends, be men. Let shame be in your hearts and discipline in the sight of other men. And each one of you remember his wife, his children and his wife, his property and his parents, whether a man's father or mother live or have died. Here now I supplicate your knees for the sake of those who are absent to stand strongly and not be turned to the terror of panic. So he spoke and stirred the spirit and heart in each man. And from their eyes, Athene pushed the darkness and mortal of mist and light came out hard against them on both sides, whether they looked from the ships or from the closing of battle. They knew Hector the great war cry. They knew his companions, whether they stood away behind and out of fighting or whether alongside the fast ships they fought in battle. Nor did it still please great-hearted Ias to stand back where the other sons of Achaeans had taken position. But he went in huge strides up and down the decks of the vessels. He wielded in his hands a great pike for sea fighting, 22 cubits long and joined together by clinchers. And as a man who is an expert rider of horses, who when he has chosen a cut and coupled four horses out of many, makes his way over the plain, galloping toward a great city along the traveled road, and many turn to admire him, men or women, while he steadily and never slipping, jumps and shifts his stance from one to another as they gallop. So I asked, reins crossing from deck to deck on the fast ships, taking huge strides, and his voice went always up to the bright sky as he kept up a terrible bellow and urged on the Danans to defend their ships and their shelters, while on the other side, Hector would not stay back among the mass of close-armored Trojans. But as a flashing eagle makes his plunge upon other flying birds as he's feed in a swarm by a river, whether these be geese or cranes or swans long-throated, so Hector steered the course of his outrush straight for a vessel with dark prows, and from behind Zeus was pushing him onward hard with his big hand and stirred on his people beside him. Now once again, a grim battle was fought by the vessels. You would say that they faced each other unbruised, unwearied in the fighting, from the speed in which they went for each other. This was a thought in each as they struggled on. The Achaeans thought they could not get clear of the evil, but must perish, while the heart inside each one of the Trojans was hopeful to set fire to the ships and kill the fighting men of Achaea. With such thoughts in mind, they stood up to fight with each other. Hector caught hold of the stern of a grand, fast-running, seafaring ship that once carried Protesilaios to Troy and did not take him back to the land of his fathers. It was around this ship that now Achaeans and Trojans cut each other down at close quarters, nor any longer had patience for the volleys exchanged from bows and javelins, but stood up close against each other, matching their fury, and fought their battle with sharp hatches and axes, with great swords and with leaf-headed spikes, and many magnificent swords were scattered along the ground, black-thonged, heavy-hilted, sometimes dropping from the hands, some glancing from the shoulders of men as they fought, so the ground ran black with blood. Hector would not let go of the stern of a ship where he had caught hold of it, but gripped the stern post in his hands and called to the Trojans, Bring fire and give single voice to the clamor of battle. Now Zeus has given us a day worth all the rest of them. The ship's capture, the ships that came here in spite of the gods' will, have visited much pain on us by our counselor's cowardice, who would not let me fight by the grounded ships, though I wanted to, but held me back in restraint and curbed in our fighters. But Zeus the wide brows, though when he fouled our intentions, comes now himself to urge us on and give us encouragement. He spoke, and they thereby came on hard against the Argives. Their volleys were too much for Ias, who could no longer who could hold no longer his place, but had to give back a little, expecting to die there. Back to the seven foot midship, and gave up the high deck of the balance ship. There he stood and waited for them, and with his pike always beat off any Trojan who carried persistent fire from the vessels. He kept up a, a terrible bellowing and urge on the Danans, friends and fighting men of the Danans, henchmen of Ares, be men now, dear friends. Remember your furious valor. Do we think there are others who stand behind us to help us? Have we some stronger wall that can rescue men from perdition? We have no city built strong with towers lying near us within which we could defend ourselves and hold off the host that matches us. 
We hold position in this plain of the close armored Trojans, bent back against the sea and far from the land of our fathers. Salvation's light is in our hands' work, not the mercy of battle. He spoke and came forward with a sharp spear raging for battle. And whenever some Trojan crashed against the hollow ships with burning fire, who sought to wake the favor of Hector, Aias would hit for him, wait for him, and then stab with a long pike, and so from close up wounded twelve in front of the vessels.